Then the king of Syria warned against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God said unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to that place which the man of God told him, and warned him of and saved him, saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel. Telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord, and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness, according to the word of Elisha. Lord, we pray, teach us your word today. Lord, all that you have to tell us today, we pray that we have willing ears to listen. Lord, we turn our hearts and our minds to you. We believe in you. We believe your word. Lord, we make the choice to believe it, to live by it. Let us understand it completely. Let us apply it to our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. We see a picture of a greater reality than what we can see. And we see a picture of a young man who, in his fear, was granted by the prophet, and of course by God who answered the prophet's prayer, that is, Elisha, the prophet. It gave him a gift of being able to glimpse the eternal reality, God's reality of what is behind the scenes that we are not privy to in our flesh. God's reality is his creation. God, in fact, created all reality. All that is real is of God. All that is true that we can believe in is that which God has created. There is one thing that someone else created, apparently, as I understand it. The devil, whose name Satan means the adversary. The devil created the lie. And Jesus called him the father of lies. Satan is the, the father of of all untruth. God is the creator of all reality. What really is, what is really true. And God calls upon us to believe what is true. Because all that is true is of God. All truth is God's truth. You've heard the common saying. Throughout Scripture, we are told the value of truth to God. In Psalm 51, David wrote, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. God wants us to be truthful from the inside out. He wants us to live according to His truth. He wants us to be truthful to men and most especially to God. If we're true to God, we'll be true to men and we'll be true to ourselves as well. We will not be then lying to ourselves. Living in unreality, living by vain imaginations, those are all false. They are not reality. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He prayed for his disciples, sanctify them, make, make them holy. Through thy truth, thy word is truth. 
He promised his disciples, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. That's what God feels about truth. And he sends us the Holy Spirit, which is called many times the Spirit of truth. That Spirit which is characterized by truth. That is God's reality is what is of the Spirit. This world is not all of reality. Even scientists have begun to conclude, they speculate, that is, that in fact, all that is solid in this world is at its base energy. And the way I see it, what God has spoken into existence and exists by His energy can be gone in the poof, just like we're told in Scripture. And God can do with it what He will. God created reality. Therefore, all that is, is true. What is untrue is contrary to God, of Satan, the adversary, and the father of lies. It's incumbent on us as believers. We call ourselves believers. And it's incumbent upon us. And we're tasked by God, given the task, to believe the truth. Not just to believe the truth we're given, but to know the truth, to find out His truth, so that we may live His truth, live in reality. As I had promised, I made some audio CDs of two messages. They're both on the same CD. They're out on the table. You're all welcome to those. You can, If you want to pass some along, you're welcome to those. If we need more, I'll run some more off. But these, I felt, were important messages. I'm not selling them, by the way. I, I was thinking, you know, I might sound like one of those traveling people that has the book table and, and the music table. I'm not selling anything, but if you want to give a donation to the church, make it out to the church. And Most of what went into this was the effort, editing and things. I doubt that it cost a dollar to make for copy. But I would like to get those into people's hands. And they are the messages prior to Christmas. First is the message I entitled Christmas Gifts of Revelation, some of you remember. How God, prior to Jesus coming, first He sent an angel to announce the birth that would come of John the Baptist. He sent an angel to announce the birth of, to come, which was speaking to Mary that she would have a child of the Holy Spirit. And He sent an angel to Joseph to assure him that that child was of the Holy Spirit, that his betrothed did not cheat on him, and to go ahead and take her to wife. But then, as I described at some length, God desires not to have to send us an angel. He does not usually. He wants us to be full of the Holy Spirit. Like Simeon, whom God had told would not die before he had seen the Messiah in person, the Messiah come. And Anna the prophetess who, who hung out in the temple faithful to be praying and praising God daily. Who was moved by that Holy Spirit to prophesy over that child who was Jesus on the day of his circumcision. And I noted, among other things, that if Simeon was not up on his prayers, if he was not in the Spirit on that day, he might have missed that gift God was giving him. Because that was a gift. To receive the Word of God, everything we receive of God is a gift. Everything in the kingdom, God's economy works on gifts. That Our faith is the currency of God's kingdom, and what God gives us back is gifts. God desires that there to be gifts in the church. That's how the church is meant to operate. And that leads me to the second message, which I entitled, God Gives gifts freely if we are ready to receive. How many gifts do you think the Lord would like to give the church if the church is ready to receive? We have to do things decently in order. We, we read the instructions of the failings, in fact, of the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And you can, you can do things that are out of order. But that church was doing a lot of things right. The Apostle Paul just wanted to direct them and, and channel them in the right direction. I've often thought about the principle of inertia. I took physics in high school. Something that is sitting still has inertia where it tends to stay sitting still. 
Something that is moving like a big wheel. Think of a big wheel. A big wheel has inertia, also called momentum, where it tends to keep going the direction it's going unless it's stopped. So many Christians, they might have faith, but they, they are sitting. They have a sitting inertia. Where they're not moving, it's hard to budge them. You can give them gifts if they want, but they might just hide them away like the steward who hid away the, the talents and did not use them, did not multiply them. And yet, you have some Christians. Often, baby Christians who come along and they're not pretty. They might be like some I've known covered with tattoos and piercings because of their past life. Even those who have not marked their body might be marked by the world in other ways. Some might be pretty rough around the edges. I've known bikers. I've known drug ex-gang members. And they can be rough. But if they're willing, they're like that big wheel that is rolling, it's going. It only needs direction in order to steer it. It's got that momentum going and it will work for God because it's, it's moving. It just needs to be steered. And all of us need to be moving, willing to move. Willing to seek new things, willing to open ourselves up to new gifts. You have to be willing to be used. You don't speak in tongues without making yourself available. You don't prophesy without taking the risk of a mistake and embarrassment. You're not used in any of the gifts that I can think of unless you are open, open-minded, most of all willing even to be embarrassed. So avail yourselves of, of those discs in the foyer if you're at all interested or would like to pass them along. Or save them as evidence against me or whatever. <laughs> we're promised things that if we're available, that the Holy Spirit will do not just for us, but through us. Did you realize that God doesn't choose to work except through His believers? If He can possibly do that. God wants to work through His church. The currency of the kingdom is faith. Faith activates our action and should motivate our action. Not just believing, but having those gifts that we receive. Gifts of the Holy Spirit. Jesus made some promises, and I didn't write them all down, just the pertinent ones. But He made some promises as to what the Holy Spirit would do for us and through us. He said in Matthew 10.19 that when you're delivered up to a trial, a trial for your faith that is, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. Given you as a gift what to say. It doesn't come from you, but it will be given you if you're ready. The Holy Spirit will teach us all things. Not make us like an encyclopedia, but teach us all things that we need to know. You've heard of a need-to-know basis. God, through His Spirit, can tell us what we need to know. And more importantly, what He wants us to know. We pray for guidance. He doesn't give us a road map. He doesn't always tell us the next step right away. But He will speak to us along the way. He wants us to stay on the right track. And He knows if we're willing to obey, that if He lets us know what He wants us to know, that we will do it. Don't we all in our hearts, I hope we do, if we hear the go word from God, don't we want to be ready to do it? Teach you all things. He will, the Holy Spirit will bring all things to your remembrance. He will testify of Jesus. He will guide us into all truth. He will not speak of Himself, but whatever He shall hear. From whom? From Jesus. Jesus seated at the right hand of the throne of God, exalted. He will hear from Jesus, not speaking of Himself, but what He hears He speaks. Right from God's throne. Hallelujah. He will show us things to come. 
He will receive from Jesus and show it to us. We're often so plugged into reality as we see it. What is our reality? It's what we see, what we can touch, what we can taste, what we've always known. Only when we're baptized in the Holy Spirit can we begin to discern what is of the Spirit. Otherwise, we might, as is said in many places, we might believe a lie. We might be deluded by untruth. But God wants to show us things of His reality. 1 Corinthians 1.28 says, God has chosen things which are not to bring to naught. N-O-U-G-H-T means nothing. Chosen things which are not to bring to nothing things that are. God's reality is different from the reality of this world. Amen. This world is under bondage, sold out to Satan, who is called the prince of the power of the air. And God, when He steps in, He changes that reality. We call it a miracle. This world, we get sick. If God chooses to heal, He steps in and He does a miracle. It's not the everyday course of things. He steps in and He changes reality because what God speaks is reality. We're told to look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. 2 Corinthians 4.18 We're told Hebrews 11.3 Things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The things we see are not reality. Romans 4.17 God who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. Things which are not, God says, let it be. And it is. Just as sure as He spoke the worlds into existence. We need to know the truth. We need to believe the truth. We need to walk in the Spirit so that we know the truth. And we need to see through God's eyes by the Holy Spirit, what the true reality is. I like the quote I saw on the internet this week. I, I heard it before, but was reminded. Smith Wigglesworth, an early Pentecostal. Smith Wigglesworth said, I am not moved by what I see. I am not moved by what I feel. I am moved by what I believe. Believe. We need to be, believe. We need to rely upon what we believe. What is delivered to us to believe? The day we accepted salvation, didn't we believe what we were spoken of from the Gospel? The Gospel comes, God adds to it the yes of His Holy Spirit, and we have the choice to believe. And we receive it. We have the internal witness then from the Holy Spirit of God's Word as we read it. Because we are told, as I preached recently, Ephesians 5.17 Be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. We have two ways of knowing the will of the Lord. The Word of God as delivered to us. And the Holy Spirit who will speak to us. Which always agree. Always confirm one another. I have sometimes needed to be corrected in reality. When I was saved, I accepted a different reality than I had lived with and I had grown with things that I could not see then became my reality I remember after being baptized in the Holy Spirit when I went forward and I was going to a big church in Houston at the time and I went forward on a call to receive the Holy Spirit and was prayed for and I didn't feel any magic I was not fluent in anything I said I was halting I, I didn't know how to do it. But I, I tried to enunciate what came to my mind. But in my case, I didn't know until a service not long after. I remember it being in that service. Big church, many sections of pews. It was one of those times when the Holy Spirit just settles down over a room. And there's a holy hush that settles down. People somehow sense the hush. And some words of tongues and then interpretation came after that. Three, as I recall. But the amazing thing, when that hush fell upon that place for the first time in my life, 
I had a sense of something even more than sensing the hush. I sensed in my spirit there would be a word from the Lord over, over this way for me. And it came right after. Just, just like that, after I sensed it. Then I sensed there would be a, a word from the Lord over to my right, and it came. And I sensed another one back this way, and it came. And I, I told myself, there's something to this Holy Spirit because I sense a reality I did not sense before. Just recently I was praying about something and I had a certain impression. I was praying and asking the Lord along, along certain assumptions I had in my mind. And I received a word of knowledge. Now, when I receive a word of knowledge, it's, some people are specially gifted, apparently. I've never, I don't recall ever receiving a, a word of knowledge for anybody else. I've never had that experience of saying, well, there's somebody over here that has a sore back and we need to, the Lord wants to heal that. You've probably seen that somewhere. And I've never, I've never lined people up and, and said, the Lord wants you to know this and the Lord wants you to know that. But the Lord has, has given me specific guidance at times. He gave me guidance when He sent me to Bible college. He gave me a choice of two places. Have I told you this story? He, uh, he told me go to Southwestern or go to Springfield. And one of the remarkable things is I chose Southwestern. I said, well, Lord, that I never lived out of Texas. And I, I, you know, that's closer. I've never been there. I've heard of it. And it, it, I felt like the Lord said, okay, when I chose. But you know, I ended up in Springfield anyway. <laughs> Because the Lord didn't send me later. In fact, I didn't, I didn't plan on telling this story, but there was a, a teacher, my Bible and theology teacher at Southwestern, J. Dalton Utsi, encouraged me three times, as I recall. He he would come, I didn't have the best grades in there. That was the worst grades I got in school. I think he gave me B's. He came to me three times and, and, and mentioned to me, well, the Assemblies of God has a, has, they called it the graduate school at that time. He said the Assemblies of God has a graduate school, and I forget what else he told me about it, but he seemed to encourage me to look into that. And it did not click until the third time. Something clicked, and I knew that I was to go on to what is now called the seminary. But that's, not, that's on the way to the, the story I was telling about a word from the Lord. We, we need to seek revelation from the Lord. He doesn't necessarily give us a daily word to go by. He requires that we walk by faith and not by sight. But He sometimes wants us to know things to do. And He gives us not just tongues, interpretation, and prophecy, but He gives us words of knowledge, which is something we need to know. He gives us words of wisdom, which is what we need to do. What to do. And in this case, I was praying along certain lines. I had a certain sense of what I should be praying, and I was asking the Lord something, and He spoke to me. It, it surprised me. It was, it was just in, it was not an audible voice. But the words came to me so clearly, and I, I don't want to be specific because it's private, but He said, it's basically, it's not as you think. The situation was not as I was thinking. And it became... It began to become clear afterward that that was true. The fact is that we don't know how to pray. We're told, Romans 8, 26, the Spirit helps our infirmities because we know not how to pray as we ought. If we don't know how to pray, we have the resource of tongues. We are told to pray in tongues because that is the Holy Spirit praying through us. What is God's will? We are told if we want God's will in our lives, if we pray, I should say, if we pray according to God's will, then we know we have the petitions that we ask of Him. And how can we know how to pray? How can we think our prayers will be answered if we don't pray according to God's will? So we need to pray in the Spirit and let the Spirit speak through us, pray through us. 
Or as God sometimes will do, He needs to reveal to us and will reveal to us if we are ready to receive. He will reveal to us how we should pray as well as what we should do. How can we think that the Lord will answer our prayer if it comes from us, if we have decided? You know, I talked about lies and Satan, the father of lies. What was the first lie in the Bible? Adam and Eve, the serpent said to them, regarding the tree of knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil, the serpent said if they ate the fruit of that tree, they would be like God. Which means they would decide for themselves. Doesn't it? Eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what's good and bad. Being like a God. Making your own decisions. And look where that has gotten the world. Not following God. But we need to know. We need to pray God's will. We need to be open to receive God's will. If our prayers are not being answered, sometimes it might just be God's timing, but maybe He's waiting on us to align ourselves with His reality. Because His reality is what is really true. And God has a plan for each of us. God purposes to do His plan. And if you read Scripture, you will see that what God purposes is as good as done in God's eyes. God gave the promise to Abraham that he would make of him with his elderly barren wife, that he would make of him a great nation. He faltered at one point and tried to do it himself. I've mentioned that before. But as far as God was concerned, he gave Abraham the promise and it was as good as done. That is God's reality, that what he purposes is as good as done. If we don't circumvent it by disobedience, let us let God purpose in our lives. He has a purpose. We need to seek His purpose, to humbly ask what His will is, to seek His face daily, to be willing. And I, I think that to hear from God, you have to first be willing to do what He says. And don't think He doesn't know. Don't think He doesn't know whether you're willing or not. So we need to be not just praying, but walking in the Spirit. You can't walk in the Spirit without the Holy Spirit baptism. I wrote down, to the extent that we don't walk in the Spirit, we walk in powerlessness against sin, powerlessness to do the will of God, and in unreality. We're told walk in the Spirit and will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Implies... We don't walk in the Spirit in what? We walk with eyes of flesh. We're subject to the infirmities, including the moral failures of the flesh. If we don't have a vision from God through the Spirit, we walk in not just unreality, but so often disappointment. We walk in illusions. This world is an illusion in many ways. We walk in vain imaginations, things that come from our own minds. I grew up, I'm rather a daydreamer, and I have to be careful because I can concoct scenarios of what I think will happen in my minds that are so vivid that I sometimes think that that's reality. But I have to stop myself. I, got to, I have to correct myself sometimes. Not let my imagination run wild because it leads me in the flesh into unreality whereas true reality is from God and we need to seek those gifts seek revelation from God which comes by being baptized in his Holy Spirit seek that revelation that we might not be unwise what the willing what the will of the Lord is so that we enter into the kingdom of God the kingdom of God is as in the Lord's Prayer the Lord prayed, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. The kingdom of God is the realm of the Spirit in which God's will is always done. Have you thought of that? And those that enter into it are those that do the will of God because they believe, activated by faith. That is the reality we should seek. 
That's the reality we should make part of us that we need to obey and we receive the tools, those gifts that the Holy Spirit will give us. Let us, let us seek the Lord. Those that perhaps are not baptized in the Holy Spirit or have not manifested gifts lately, because we do need a, a fresh filling once in a while. Sometimes we, we need a boisterous service and lots, lots of music and a lot of noise to receive those things. When I received the Holy Spirit baptism, it wasn't a big emotional thing. I just asked the Lord humbly for it. He gave it. I was not sure of it till later. But we can all receive a new filling or a fresh filling right now. Not even, we don't need even to make a demonstration of it, but just receive it. Or look upon your people this morning. Look upon as you indeed see each heart which is bare and naked before you, Lord. All the motivations of life, all the thoughts, all the desires, Lord. We come to you so many times with so much baggage. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, old past hurts, baggage that we drag behind us and that weigh us down, and that so often hinder us from being free to receive what you have. But Lord, we lay aside that baggage. We drop that load, Lord. We choose to drop that load. We ask you to take that load, that burden off of us. You take the yoke off our backs, Lord. You said that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. So we ask to drop that yoke of our burdens to take up your, your cross, Lord. Lord, and we choose right now by the choice you have given us, the ability to choose, not to be our own gods, not to make our own choices and to do things our own way by our own choosing, but to choose to follow You, to obey Your commandments, to learn and seek after what You want us to know, to seek after Your truth, Lord. We lay down our version of reality. And we pick up, Lord, Your reality. Your greater reality is real as when that young servant looked and saw the chariots of the angels, Lord. And God said, those that are with us are greater than those that are with them. We have an inheritance, Lord, of power from on high. Not just the angels, but God's Holy Spirit, part of the Godhead, who connects through our human spirit, who connects us, in fact, to the right hand of the throne of God, where the Son of God exalted is seated and all things have been put under His feet. Lord, we, we take upon us Your kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in our lives. We choose from this point onward to seek Your kingdom. To walk by not our vain imaginations, Lord, but our choice to follow You. To pray in tongues that we might pray Your perfect will. Lord, to pray as we're commanded to, as You would speak to us a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, a prophecy, interpretation, whatever You would tell us, Lord, we choose to walk by that, to make that our reality, to live according to what we believe, not what we see, not what we feel, but what You have delivered unto us to believe through Your Word and through Your Holy Spirit. We choose to obey You we choose to follow You. We choose to live a Spirit-filled life given to us from God because You are the way, You are the truth, and You are the life which is eternal life within us by the Holy Spirit. We make that choice, Lord. We choose Your truth. We lay down our baggage. Lord, all our hopes and dreams, which are so often dashed, let us not depend upon them, but lay them down. 
Lord, let us put on your altar all of ourselves, our mortal bodies. Put on your altar a living sacrifice. Lord, we know that what we put on your altar, sometimes you give it back and have sanctified it. And other times by your choice, other times what we put upon your altar, you take it and you burn it before our eyes. But we without fear before you, without fear for our human lives, Lord, we put all of ourselves on the altar. We put ourselves on the altar. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you. We put our all on your altar. We hold nothing back. We must hold nothing back. We put it on your altar. And as you have called upon us to make sacrifice, we leave it to you what to give back and what to burn. Because it represents our willingness. It represents our personal consecration to you. It represents, Lord, our commitment. Lord, we tarry for you are doing a work. We tarry. And the thing about, about putting our all on the altar and choosing to follow the will of the Lord, that is how we will be blessed. We will then be blessed through obedience. It might not be the blessings which in our flesh that we would choose, but those that are glorious, that are mighty, that are powerful, that are eternal. And yes, sometimes God blesses us with great riches in this world, but let it be a blessing from God and not something we've engineered ourselves. Let it be God's gift. Let us be ready to receive those gifts. All God's gifts are good gifts. Lord, let us receive your gifts, whatever they be. They are all good and right and holy. Good and right and holy. Lord, go with us as we go from this place. Lord, let the message that is for us, the part of the message that you have targeted for us, each of us, go with us, dwell with us. Let the choice that we have made linger and in fact be branded on our hearts from this time forward to change us. And we ask your blessings as we go forth in dismissal. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.